Welcome to the Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news and sometimes interviews. This is episode 25, recorded November 21st, 2020. I'm your host, Charles Grant. And in today's episode, we have some of the effects COVID has had on the locksmith industry, ATM security, or lack thereof, lock picking club shirts by Mr. Paradise, Daz Evers shows how to make a universal DD pick, the 1971 Media Pennsylvania FBI office break in. More criminals, sales, giveaways, and more. You can find the show on most podcast apps, YouTube, and at thelocksportscast.com. YouTube and a few of the podcast apps have restrictions that limit my ability to post full show notes with all of the links. So if you're using one of those, make sure you go to www.thelocksportscast.com where you will find show notes that include all of the links. Real quick, I want to say a special thanks to Don's Locks for helping to get the pack lock that Pocket Woman won all the way to her in Australia. It was very much appreciated. In the news this week, we'll start off with an article that came across my desk here. It says, State of the Industry 2020, a manufacturer's perspective. And it says, despite the challenges of COVID-19, interest in security remains strong and locksmiths will have to adapt to keep up with changes. This year has proven to be unlike any in recent memory. New terms such as social distancing, shelter in place, and essential business came into common use as did old technology seemingly previously used only by specialists, namely face masks. So it was in the security industry, new products with particular emphasis on Bluetooth-based smart credentials continued to roll off the assembly line, but older technology, particularly touchless actuators, gained new emphasis. As the year wound down, we invited three security manufacturers to provide some perspective and take a look at the road ahead. And some of the, just a couple of the quick quotes from that article here. With the global pandemic, the nature of security and what that means in general has changed. And our role to facilitate, facilitate security and safety from a health perspective has been evaluated. We've met that challenge with product innovation, whether it be antimicrobial surfaces, touchless solutions, or more sophisticated technology to integrate health screening and PPE in compliance before electronic access control permits entry into a facility, such as an office or sporting venue. Another quote from that article says, the security business with regard to the locksmith was strong, then COVID hit, and it certainly affected the industry. One of the main reasons is that we saw schools naturally close down, and so did the hospitals as far as maintenance and security. Commercial properties have slowed down tremendously. Residential has slowed down because people don't want to take the chance of having a locksmith come into their houses now. It's just an interesting take on what, uh, what has happened to the industry because of COVID restrictions and concerns. And in a similar line, another article that came across my desk was entitled Southampton Residents Warn After Rise in Rogue Locksmiths. Homeowners have been urged to be on their guard following reports of rising number of rogue locksmiths. The Master Locksmiths Association, MLA, the largest trade body in the UK representing the profession, has issued a warning to Southampton residents. This follows a survey by the trade body that shows 66% of its members have been called to a job after homeowners have inadvertently called out a rogue locksmith over the past 12 months. Collectively, respondents attended more than 300 botched jobs involving a rogue locksmith over the last year. 65% said rogues are overcharging customers by 200 pounds or more. Stefan George, managing director of the MLA, said, The industry is unregulated, so it's easy to set up as a locksmith with no training, experience, or insurance. During the pandemic, we expect the number of incidents involving rogue locksmiths to rise as people under increasing financial pressure see it as an easy way to make money. That's where it ties in with the other one. The rise in rogue locksmiths, they think, is a direct result of 
the financial hardships imposed by the pandemic. In another sort of related article, Pompiers of Paris chide public over callouts for spiders and lost keys. For Parisians who find themselves locked out without their keys, stuck in a lift, or confronted with large spiders, a wasp nest, or a water leak, there is a common reflex. Call 1-8. Cue the arrival of the heroic Pompiers of and the city's first responders, who, if necessary, will sell down the roof, kick in a window, and let you back into your home. Now, however, the Pompiers, a branch of the military whose main job is dealing with fires and medical emergencies, is asking the city's residents to call a locksmith, pest control, or a plumber unless it is really a matter of life or death. According to the Paris Brigade, its 8,500 Pompiers were called out 507,258 times last year and saved 30,801 lives. In a typical year, about a million people ring 1-8 which is the equivalent of 999 in the UK or 911 in the US, half of all calls result in a turnout. And of these, only 60% are said to require life-saving action. In July, the Pompiers highlighted some of the abusive calls they had received, including requests to help with a stuck sofa, a phone left in a taxi, a spider the size of a man's thumb in the living room, and a twisted ankle. Two out of every five interventions do not require any emergency action. Often it's a question of callouts because of social distress linked to loneliness and lack of contact, said Commander Patricia Monnier. The phenomenon is especially acute in Paris where so many people live alone and their reflex is to call 1-8. This kind of call is steadily growing around 3% a year. So sounds like uh, a lot of people stuck in their homes with all these lockdowns and they're lonely. And when anything comes up, rather than trying to think of who to properly call, they just reflexively call 1-8. So if you live in Paris, please think about who you should be calling and is it actually an emergency? Another article I ran across was entitled How to Rob a Bank. And it starts off saying, ATM security is startlingly lax. When you think of secure, reliable, mission-critical computers, you naturally think of Windows, right? It's obvious. It's so bulletproof, especially Windows XP. That's evidently the thinking behind many, and perhaps most, of the world's automated teller machines, which are little more than a PC motherboard connected to a cash drawer. Everything you know and love about Windows is on display sometimes literally, including its file system, patch history, security protocols, command prompt, help system, and the dreaded blue screen of death. If you want to rob a bank today, all you really need is a USB thumb drive, a Cat5 cable, and a passing familiarity with Windows. No Tommy gun or 1934 Ford Deluxe sedan required. Oh, and it helps to have a fake bank guard's uniform. The first and sometimes the only level of protection is a small metal box surrounding the PC motherboard and other components. It's typically sheet metal with a lock or two to keep out evildoers, but PCs need ventilation, so the box will have holes to help them promote airflow. These holes are sometimes large enough that you're able to insert tools, remove cables, or otherwise tamper with the computer, all without doing so much as unlocking the enclosure. Not that unlocking it is all that difficult. Any person with entry-level expertise in lockpicking can do it. You don't need the skills to open a bank vault or crack a safe in order to gain access to an ATM computer. Just think of all the money that's sitting there pretty easy to get to for somebody who's properly motivated. It's amazing how many systems in this world run on Windows XP still. I, uh, the self-checkout systems at my local store still do that. I've seen them when they crash. And in community news this week, uh, Terrell shared a tweet by Packlock that, was, that said, Lockpicking Lawyer just dropped a nuclear bomb, and it has a link to his video showing how their new thinner comb picks are able to exploit the overlift attack on every master lock puck lock that they were able to get their hands on. And uh, Packlock has also made a few tweets since then explaining how only a few of their locks will be susceptible to it, and that's just a matter of bidding. 
but they are taking steps to alleviate even that. Sherelle also shared a link to a video by Mr. Paradise. Mr. Paradise has made some shirts for... If you're part of the Lockpickers United Discord or the Reddit, you will notice that a lot of people refer to being in the 1100 Club or the Rattle Club or things like that. You make a cert, you pick an 1100, you get to say you're part of the 1100 Club, you pick a Medico, you're part of the Medico Club, Club Med. Or if you turn the core too far on your Master Lock 410 and you turn it into Rattle, you've joined the Rattle Club, which I am a proud member of myself. Anyway, Mr. Paradise has made shirts that reflect those different clubs, 1100, Club Med, and the Rattle Club, and he is planning on selling them. So if you want to go over and check out his video and see what they look like, there will be a link in the show notes. Also, I saw a video by Daz Evers where he shares a design and instructions to make a universal DD pick. It's a simple design that looks like it should be pretty effective, so I wanted to make sure everybody knew about that, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Looks like it should be pretty easy to make without any real specialized tools. That's part of the way he designed it. So make sure you go check that out if you're planning on getting into picking DD locks. It, he says it should work for front tensioning, rear tensioning, or random disc tensioning locks. It all is down to the tips that you make to put in it. And on the karate belt front this week, we have Man Cave Man got his red belt, and Mr. Black Magic and Fairly Decent Picker Dude both received their purple belts. So congratulations, gentlemen. You're well on your way to the black belt status. All right, now it's time to take a quick break and say thank you to the people that made this episode possible. Executive producers for this episode are the $5 Patreon subscribers. We have Meddler, Panda Frog, Michael Gilchrist, Starry Lock, William Sprain, and To Be Deciphered. Content producers for this episode are Cherell, Lock Picking's Gal, Rune Picker, Starry Lock, and Pocket Woman. Just remember, this show is only possible because of the support of the community. So if you are getting value out of this podcast, please help support it. The most important way you can do that is by sending in your Locksport, Locksmith, Lock Picking related news to me so I can put it in the show. You can send it to podcast at thelocksportscast.com or just go to thelocksportscast.com and click on the support tab in the menu and it will give you all my contact information and different ways you can get that information to me. Don't forget to share the podcast with your lock picking friends, either in person or online. You can leave a re- review if you want on your favorite podcasting platform if they do that, or you can leave a comment and a thumbs up on YouTube. There's also Patreon or PayPal, where you can do one-time donation or a subscription. It's up to you. In lockpicking criminal news this week, I came across a story that's entitled, Man Arrested Casing Cars Has Drugs and Paraphernalia. On November 9th at about 12.30 p.m., an alert citizen notified the Lincoln Police Department of two suspicious men in a shopping center parking lot on Groveland Lane. They appeared to be casing vehicles. A description of the men and their vehicle was provided. Officers arrived, contacted the men. Drug paraphernalia was visible inside the vehicle and the suspect in the driver's seat, 23-year-old Dustin Lee of Antelope, was found to have an active felony warrant, violation of post-release community supervision. During a search of the vehicle, officers located methamphetamine, heroin, lock-picking devices, and debit cards belonging to other persons. Lee was arrested for the applicable charges and booked at South Placer Jail where he was ineligible for bail. There is no evidence the passenger committed any crime. Thank you to the alert citizen who reported the suspicious behavior, it says. And another article I came across was entitled, Teen Who Fired Shots Crashed Into a Building Is Facing Multiple Charges. A teen who police said fired shots at someone in another vehicle, then crashed into a building last Thursday, is facing multiple charges. Wayne Dews, 19, was charged with theft of property, aggravated assault, and reckless endangerment. He also suffered serious injuries when the vehicle he was driving ran into the C&W Cafe on South Highland Park Avenue and 23rd Street. Police say he was driving a stolen vehicle. The uh, driver he reportedly fired shots at was not injured. 
Dews and a Jamal Shepard, age 29, had previously been arrested on September 26 after getting out of a black Nissan Altima at the Grove Street Market that had been taken in an earlier carjacking. Both defendants ran when they were told by police to stop. They were apprehended after a foot pursuit. Inside the vehicle, police found two Glock firearms, two digital scales with marijuana residue, and a lock picking kit that police said is used to steal cars. Dews acknowledged buying one of the guns illegally, said he kept it for protection. He also said he uses marijuana, though he is underage to do so. At the time, Dews was on bond for aggravated assault and reckless endangerment. Shepard had prior felonies of theft of property and having contraband in a penal institute. His driver's license had been revoked. He was seen getting out of the driver's side and Dews out of the passenger side. So let's see, out on bond for aggravated assault and reckless endangerment, he gets stopped in a vehicle that has been carjacked. He's in possession of, illegally in possession of stolen firearms and materials to distribute and sell marijuana and to a lock picking kit. And then he gets busted for shooting out of a car at another vehicle and crashing into a building. All of this at the early age of 19. Looks like he's got a wonderful life ahead of him. All right, and on to the main topic for this week, the 1971 break-in of the Media Pennsylvania FBI office. I'm going to cover the break-in, kind of gloss over the, the reasons and the politics behind it and the uh, aftermath. If you want to catch up on the whole story, I will have links in the show notes to an excellent documentary about it and a, a few other things that will give you some more information on it. So be sure to check those out if this piques your interests. On the evening of March 8th, 1971, eight anti-war activists that called themselves the Citizens Committee to Investigate the FBI broke into an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. The caper was well-planned and carefully executed. Many of the members had taken part in previous break-ins to into draft boards to destroy records, which at the time it was a paper system, and destroying the paper records really pretty much destroyed their system. This had given them a good amount of experience in how to do casing and break-ins. They had initially considered breaking into the central FBI office in Philadelphia, but considered it impossible as it was located in a federal building that was open 24-7. The media office, however, was in a second-story walk-up apartment building. The office was closed at 5 p.m. every day, and there was no security present in that building. The FBI office was located above the manager's apartment. That was a little complication. And across the street from the Delaware County Courthouse. They cased the building for weeks, learned the habits and schedules of the residents and the schedule of the office. They observed and noted the level of police activity around the building and the courthouse across the street, which had a guard posted 24-7. The area was well lit. The guard had a direct view of the entrance to the building containing the FBI office, so that was a concern for everyone involved. A female member of the team was sent in undercover posing as a college student, checking on the prospects for careers for women in the FBI. She was tasked with getting a general layout of the office, checking for any signs of an alarm system, and checking to see if the file cabinets were independently locked or they were the unlocked type. The lock picker of the group, Keith, was self-taught. He took a locksmith correspondence course and made his own tools out of spring steel. He had checked the building out himself and the office doors ahead of time, observed only standard pin tumbler locks, and there were no signs of an alarm that he could see either. On the evening of March 8, 1971, specifically timed to be during the Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier fight, he entered the building to pick the lock of the office door. When he arrived at the door, he found what he described as a circular lock. He had no experience in picking that type of lock and was extra concerned that the lock had been changed because somebody inside their group had betrayed them. He went back out of the building and called the others. Bonnie, 
The woman who had cased the building earlier remembered that there was another door that entered the office and had a filing cabinet behind it blocking it. Keith returned to the building, picked that lock, but the door didn't open. It appeared to be held by an interior deadbolt on the upper part of the door. He listened to the sounds of the fight coming from the apartments and waited for a crowd swell. When he heard the roar of the crowd, he used his crowbar to bust the door open. It opened about an inch before hitting the filing cabinet behind it. He slowly and carefully worked through the filing ca- worked the filing cabinet back until he had enough room to fit through. He then closed the door and exited the building to call the others. Once in the office, they stole every document they could find, around 1,000 in total. The files were loaded into suitcases and carried out like they were going on a trip. They took the documents to a farmhouse and began sorting them. They found that 60% of those documents detailed political surveillance, the most damaging of which, which showed illegal activities by the FBI, were sent to three media organizations and two members of Congress. Most of this was almost completely squashed by FBI pressure. All but the Washington Post returned them to the FBI. There was a struggle internally with the Washington Post, but eventually they decided to go ahead and publish them once they had verified that they were genuine. They were published on March 24th of that year by the reporter Betty Metzger. One of the documents revealed the existence of the COINTELPRO program, which was a counterintelligence program of the FBI working to infiltrate and disrupt political groups within the U.S., and they pulled a lot of dirty tricks, a lot of what are illegal activities for the government, and this was all brought to light by Congress, congressional investigations. The FBI investigated the break-in with over 200 special agents. They immediately suspected that the female student had been casing the place, and Hoover ordered agents to find me that woman. They investigated for five years till the statute of limitations ran out and no arrests were ever made. The only one of the group that was officially listed in paperwork at the FBI to be a suspect was Bonnie, the woman who went in, but they didn't have enough evidence evidently to arrest her. Two members of the group were later arrested in another break-in operation. They stood trial for that, but were ultimately not convicted because the jury was convinced that the circumstances in that era justified what they did. If you're interested in the the rest of the story, hearing the political motivations behind the break-in and the ultimate uh, outcome of the investigations afterwards, you can check out a book that was written about it by Betty Metzger, the reporter who broke the story at the Washington Post. She has a book out called The Burglary. It was released in 2014. I'll put a link in the show notes. There's also a documentary about it called 1971. It is available for rental or purchase on a couple of different platforms. There's also a version on YouTube, and I will have a link to that in the show notes. And in the resources section this week, I have another quick thing that Terrell shared. He shared a link to lockanalyst.org that has some really great animations for beginning lock pickers that cover uh, how lock picking works and the theories and the practice behind it with really good 3D animations. So I will have a link to that in the show notes as well, or you can just go to lockanalyst.org and I'm sure you can find it in the links there. For sales this week, we have the same two I've been promoting over and over again. Commando Locks has 15% off all locks with the coupon code FALL2020 that expires on January 1st. Mako Locks has the 15% off code by Mako. Again, unknown expiration, but it was good when I checked right before hitting the record button. Giveaways this week, we have Lock Pickings Gal is still has her uh, hashtag kindness lock giveaway going. So take says, please take a moment, enter my giveaway. I would love to hear an act of kindness that you received or did for someone else. I think we could all use some kind stories. This is open to anyone, anywhere. And she's giving away a Packlock BL-17A with her logo engraved in it. So go over there and check that out. 
It uh, is going to end December 4th. Room Picker, the RP Spicy Challenge giveaway. I haven't seen any notice yet that that has been ended, so you can still get in on that one before his wife comes back from maternity leave, which is currently estimated to be December 1st. And Starlock and Pocket Woman are still doing the hashtag shoutout Monday series. There's a total of eight shoutouts happening this month, four of them by Starlock, four of them by Pocket Woman. They're highlighting channels that have less than 100 subscribers. All you have to do to enter is to watch the shoutout video, go to the nominated video and subscribe, leave a comment and a like saying you were sent there by Starlock or you were sent there by Pocket Woman for Starlock. Make sure that you use the name Starry Lock in the comment because that's what they do to select the eligible entries. And you can check out the Starry Lock's channel and Pocket Woman's channel for those videos. I will have links to both in the show notes. I am currently still doing the Charles Builds Crap and the Lock Sports Cast Pack Lock a Month giveaway. Uh, I'm scheduled to keep doing it through the end of next month. And then I'll have to reassess and see if I'm going to keep it going. But as for now, it is still on. You can enter that by providing information that I can use in the podcast or sharing the podcast online and tagging me to make sure I know that you shared it. And remember that this podcast needs your support. Uh, I can't do this without your help. So if you are getting value out of this podcast, make sure to send in any information that you come across that's Locksport related. Nothing's too big, nothing's too small. You can share the podcast with your lockpicking friends. You can leave a review on your favorite podcasting app if they allow it, or you can leave a comment and a thumbs up on YouTube. You can subscribe via Patreon or PayPal. You can leave a one-time donation on PayPal. Also, if you support the show in some major way, I'll give you producer credit and mention you in the podcast. So if you have a channel or something you'd like me to share, make sure you send me a link. Thanks, and keep it legal.